maybe more than two or three seconds. <laughs> All right. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Summer Fundraising. Great to have so many of you here. See, lots of folks have logged in already to tune into this conversation I'm having with Mark Pittman today on nonprofit leadership and how you can develop yourself as a leader. So if you're new to Summer Fundraising, which is this live weekly broadcast I do, I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's a live weekly show that I host each week where we talk about inspiration for fundraising all summer long. And this week, Mark is kicking off our special series of guests that we have on the show. And so I'm very excited to be here today talking with him. So a couple of quick uh, housekeeping items for those of you who are in the webinar room already. Hopefully you saw my note over in the chat box. Um, sometimes you have to refresh your feed to get the video and the sound to start. Um, if you are over on Facebook Live watching us there, you're welcome to join us over on Crowdcast so you can join the conversation and our live discussion. You can come over to crowdcast.io forward slash Vanessa E. Chase, and you'll see a listing there for this event. And finally, if you're enjoying this broadcast, we'd love for you to share it. There's a share button just below this video feed. You'll see um, it says share and there's a little icon. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> and you'll be able to share it. Um, on social media. And if you're watching over on Facebook Live, you can also share the live feed to groups and also your personal timeline as well. So I wanted to introduce this week's guest and get right into our conversation. I'm really excited to be here with my longtime friend and mentor, Mark Pittman. Mark is an international fundraising coach and nonprofit trainer. He helps nonprofit board members and staff get excited about asking for money. And he is currently the I have founder of the Concord Leadership Group and also of fundraisingcoach.com, which I'm sure many of you know him from. Mark also has quite a few other projects and endeavors going on. He's the author of Ask Without Fear, the executive director of the Nonprofit Academy, and also an advisory panel member at Roger, which is a prestigious international fundraising think tank. So welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was such a nice introduction. I think mentor was the one that really got, thank you. Oh, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I learned I think so I, much from you. I think I've been following your fundraising blog since I started fundraising years ago, long before I ever became a consultant. Wow. <laughs> Yay, thanks. Oh, I'm, glad I, I'm glad I could be there. <laughs> <laughs> so we're here today to talk about leadership in the nonprofit sector. And I wanted to start by asking you, um, you know, what really sparked your interest in nonprofit leadership? I know you've written a couple of white papers on it and you blog a lot about leadership, but I'm always curious to hear how people sort of got interested in these kinds of topics. Well, that's, it's, I was, I was born at a young age. My parents named were mom and dad. No, I won't go that far. Um, my wife always says that I give $10 answers when people want like buck 50. <laughs> so, um, but for me, I grew up in a leadership family, a family that was, I had, responsibilities as a kid, but I also had responsibilities because I was a pitman. So I had to go to school because I was a kid. All kids go to school. I was a pitman. So I also had to listen to Zig Ziglar and uh, Charlie, read books by Charlie Tremendous Jones and do these other motivational and other goal setting types things. So leadership was always a, something I was learning about uh, to the point where it, I realized I could get my master's in it. I had originally thought I was going to be the theological nerd. Uh, I was going to do Jewish and Christian relations ending with Dietrich Bonhoeffer in World War II and wow. his attempt to assassinate Hitler. I mean, it was, I've always been very goal focused. So I had a very detailed plan until my advisor told me that I'd have to learn five different versions of Hebrew because it changes through medieval times. And I'd have to learn theological German, theological French and all this other stuff. I was like, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when I found out that my GREs were ending uh, and I, or the time limit, I had a, you have like five year window or something. And so I realized I could get a master's in organizational leadership. So I did that. Um, I think it's, so it's always been a pet interest of mine, but I think what really, really brought it, kicked it off was when Emily and I were living at a boarding school in Long Island. We kept finding that we gravitated to students, student leaders, and we felt like we were cheating because they were the fun kids. Like those were the ones that were really fun to be around and they were engaging and interesting. And we knew that we needed to be with these other people. We needed to be with the ones that were struggling uh, in visible ways. Uh, they were having a hard time with their academics or they're having behavior issues. What we found out was that the students that were promoted into student leadership were left alone. People thought you've got it all together because there weren't any, they weren't presenting with the typical I need help sort of systems that the school had right. set up. So we, uh, it took about a year because most, of, I don't know if you're like this, but for me, it's, if I enjoy doing something, it's not really, it can't be real. It can't be my work. Hmm. Um, there's a part of me that still feels like I'm <laughs> cheating. 
<laughs> to I be really, that. really committed, I have to do something I really hate, <laughs> and that will it be has great. To be hard, right? Out of feel like pushing totally a rock your hill. So, like fundraising. <laughs> so I, I well, yeah. so there was a fundraising story at the same school. Um, one of my teachers, I just come back from another major donor trip, and teacher was at one of my colleagues was asking me we were out, we were going on a camping trip with this student group. We were driving on some Long Island camp, camping on like, material on Long Island. Just seems like an oxymoron from this kid from Maine, but it was we were doing that. And um, I was trying to make, you know, it, how hard it was. I was trying to like use lower tones and yeah, my work and blah, blah, blah. It was a hard trip. And it's because traveling isn't that great, but I love it. Um, and Dave <laughs> looked over at me and he said, you really love what you do, don't you? <laughs> and I kind of felt like I was outed. And I went, yeah, I really do. And he said, I'm so glad because I would never want to do that at all. <laughs> I would, I like my classroom. I like to know what to expect. I create the boundaries for this. You could have a donor throw anything at you and you don't know what's coming next. So I've learned that even though the stuff that I thoroughly enjoy doesn't mean that other people don't enjoy it. Um, but the point, so that just being with those students and realizing how isolated our organizational systems make people, as you move up in leadership, you are removed from some of the peer networks that you've you that brought you to the place to be able to develop you to be the leader and um there are so many isolated student leaders and then we realized that having led some organizations ourselves and then working with clients that um isolation is really rife and and right. leadership at least in western leadership i don't know if i'm not as familiar with other forms but um as a leadership coach i can i've i've always i've always had a heart for making sure leaders are equipped uh because they're well, think about nonprofit leadership. How messed up is nonprofit leadership? And it's not the leaders. I'm totally committed, but to to the leaders. So don't hear any of this. Uh, I hope you guys listening. You know, I don't want to get letters about Mark is snarky and doesn't care about us. I do, but if you think about like for a business, you've got um, the the person who runs the business maybe started the business, and then there's a customer that they serve. The customer funds the business, and it's this sort of binary relationship. Mm -hmm. um, for nonprofits, you have a nonprofit executive director who's got their boss, who's the board, not just a boss, it's mm -hmm. the board, this kind of conceptual group of people who often think they are their boss, even in between meetings when they're not, it's just when they're meeting. And then you've got your staff who kind of feels like they should, you should know everything because you're the boss. The board hired you to do everything they didn't want to do. So they're offloading their to-do list. The staff is sort of like, in, a, in, the, in the worst cases, the staff is, is saying, well, you have to answer all the questions. And then you serve the people that you serve. Maybe it's feeding people, maybe it's conserving land or, or you know, spaying pets or something. Right. And you have that. But the funding doesn't come from the people you serve. It comes from the customer, uh, the donors. So right. it's got like this four sort of pulls, the board, the donors, the staff, the beneficiary, the people that are benefiting. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, we, it's really rife. <laughs> Nonprofit leaders are an amazing breed. And well, so I really want to make sure they're supported. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a complicated and interesting structure, right? Because there are, as you said, you know, the volunteer roles, but in governance, there are, you know, some types of relationships in which, you know, the board is not necessarily managing, but overseeing the executive director. And yet as volunteers, you know, they may not necessarily be equipped to really carry out that role in the way it needs to be carried out or figure out how to best support the executive director. That's true. And, and, and that's part of it. It's, it's, it's mutual. It's not that anybody like Simone Jura says, nobody wakes up, no board member wakes up in the morning and says, hmm, how can I be a lousy board member today? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's the equipping and it's the expectations. Um, and, and a lot, well, um, as is indicated by the questions that are below the screen, if you're watching on Crowdcast, um, the, a lot of uh, people that are, are, are nonprofits tend to be so lean and so, so uh, flat organizational structure wise that there's not a lot of professional development. So not a lot of people know how to lead. Um, and there's a book from the seventies. I, I think it's the seventies. That was the Peter principle. Have you heard of this? I don't think I have. No. So the, the author is the last name is Peter. I still haven't read the book. It's on my shelf. Um, okay. But the idea, the thesis is people rise to their own level of incompetence. You do a job really well, so you get promoted to the next level. And if you do that really well, you get promoted to the next level, but you stop getting promoted when you aren't being really excellent anymore. 
Right. And so, so there's this really interesting Peter principle of, um, and please, none of the people listening to this are, are, you know, exhibit that I'm sure, but we all, um, we have a tendency to promote people into organizational structures. Here's, here's one for the fundraisers. If you're really great at major gift fundraising, you get promoted to managing major gift fundraisers. And that mm -hmm. seems to and logically make sense because you're good at it. You can do this, but you're not trained how to manage people. You're just good at talking to donors and raising money. Um, and so fortunately I had enough coaches early on that I realized what I didn't want to do was manage a team. Cause you, if you've talked to people that were excellent major gift fundraisers who then lead a staff, it can often be some of the most frustrated people in the world because the staff is the ones that keep them from getting out and talking to the donors. That was why they get into this in the first place. Right. Um, yeah. So, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of different layers of lack of preparation or expectation setting. That's One of the really best managers of fundraisers I've ever seen was uh, in an organization based out of Northern California, and the woman doesn't have any fundraising experience at all. She knows people. Ah, and so she was free to release sense. people and to do the stuff. She learned fundraising skills. She learned the best. She kept abreast of what was the best. Yeah. But um, she gave a latitude so that it wasn't micromanaging, saying, I've done this, and this is how you have to do it. Um, she she lets, let people kind of develop their own style, which is... I love that. That's that was a remarkable. great approach. Yeah. So I feel like you've touched on this a little bit, but I'm always curious to know, you know, what do you see as some of the big sort of gaps or challenges that are really facing leaders in the sector? I know you mentioned sort of lack of training and support and the kind of odd yeah. structures within nonprofits. Are there any other ones that you've seen quite a bit? Well, part of the, yes, and there's statistics on them in part because there are great organizations like Compass Point and Board Source and um, there's Third Sector New England, um, Bridgespan that are doing these studies that are showing, you know, kind of what's going on with directors and executive directors and boards. Um, there, what we didn't, I didn't see was a, a lower than the board level or the executive director level, like what was going on within organizations. Because if we're doing our job well, we should be growing our staff to take over that job. Um, the number, of, or we should be growing board members to be able to be the board chair, and that didn't seem to be happening. So, Concord Leadership Group, my firm, started a, a research project um, and released it last year. And so, there's some statistics in there that ob objectively say this is what people are telling us are the issues. Um, but one of the so before I even mention, just refer to a couple of statistics. Um, one of the things that really is a problem right now in leadership is uh, board bullying. Mm. We have boards that are um, hiring executive directors and then treating them worse than they'd let their own kids be treated on a school uh, playground. Uh, wow. they're, getting, they're harassed. They're getting calls at middle of the nights. They're getting legal actions taken against them. Such toxic situations from people that pe – some pe honest, I mean, I know people. Some people deserve legal actions taken against them. That's, But if you hired the person, you know, why, it's, it's like they flipped a switch and they became the evil nemesis all of a sudden. Oh, we're here to make your life awful now. Um, and that is, I, it was, if it were anecdotal, it would be inter one thing. You know, one person had a bad experience. But over the course of the last 18 months, I've had a number of clients that are, uh, I'm kind of their safe safety valve, mm -hmm. um, and I'm helping them say, you nope, know, that's really inappropriate. Yep, no, that's wrong. And just validating what's going on where they're, you know, they have to get legal advice somewhere else. But that is a huge issue. Wow, um, I had no idea that was happening right now. In oh, I mean, well, I'm so glad. Lots of I'm, other types of like internal bullying and sexual harassment and things like that, but I've never heard of you know board relationships becoming that sour with the executive director. That's crazy. It, I'm so glad that you haven't. Yeah, no, it, I think what it, part of it is, um, I think it's the ego of the board. Some board members have egos. Um, oh, we all do to some extent, obviously. But um, I think it's an, an under, misunderstanding of what the role of the board is. Uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and unfortunately, it's not just boards that have been working boards and now are moving to hiring their first staff. This was a couple of these were really established organizations. One that was actually, um, it wasn't the board, it was the founder do it bullying the development director. It was a dysfunctional family. He was this founder of a nonprofit, had loved being in touch with the people on the front line, and grew it so much that he needed middle managers. Okay. 
And then everything, every step after that, what he did was undercutting the middle manager. He'd hire this person, but then he'd go to the staff and say, what's really going on? And what are they really doing? And how can I help you? And became a confidant for those people because that's what he loved. So instead of having the integrity of saying, we're going to have a small organization, he consistently churned through the middle staff because he kept undercutting them and mm. uh, usurping their authority, which was... Um, not a good place to be. How is a middle manager? Do you point that out to your boss? Do you see what you're doing? Yeah. Well, I think <laughs> um, that's often the challenge in like confronting some of these leadership issues, especially if you're a staff more in middle management or maybe a little bit lower on the org chart, is how do you feel empowered enough to talk to people in more senior positions about their leadership style yeah. or how to you know, better manage or whatever that might be. I mean, I think that could be a really delicate conversation sometimes. Absolutely, especially because if you, your natural reaction is to realize, okay, if the board is the boss, then somebody on the board needs to hear that this is going on. Mm -hmm. But that's actually inappropriate because that could be just gossiping and, and um, you know, kind of worm tongue in Lord of the Rings, you know, just sort of creating <laughs> rumors and, and stuff. Um, and, and that can be very, to very toxic and inappropriate. It's spread like a cancer. But there's got to be a way that people, well, so here's part of what our study found out. 61% of CEOs reported that they aren't getting any sort of annual review at all. Really? Wow. Over a thousand nonprofits took this from all over North America and around the world, uh, mostly North America. Yeah. 61% said there's no, no formal annual review process. And it was something like 42% of nonprofits don't even have any formal mechanisms for job performance at all. Wow. So almost half of the nonprofits that responded were like, yeah, we're not really evaluating employees at all. And if you think like about it, this big missed opportunity there, huge op yeah. missed opportunity. If only, so, you know, there's the carrot and the stick. Mm -hmm. The carrot is there could be just great employee retention and um, optimization of practices and making your mission really work. The stick is you could have be developing a really good paper reason for letting people get out the door. You know, you could be papering their file, personnel file for this is why this is a lack of performance. Either way, there's still really good reasons to do it. But, but I mean, <laughs> reality is we're so stretched. And so most of the people, the organizations I've worked in, employee reviews are one of those, what Covey would call quadrant two time. It's hmm. important. We know it's important, but it's not urgent. It's not screaming at the door for us to answer. It's not the phone and saying, pick me up. So it's like thank you notes to donors. Yes. Yeah, we know we want to do that and it's really important, but I, I got to answer this stuff, email right? first. I got to check this <laughs> Facebook update first. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think that's part of a real part of the issue is that there's no, no one even objectively saying this doesn't, this isn't acceptable or this is acceptable or let's just, mm -hmm. how's it going? Uh, I mean, ideally, it would be to have a 360 review with the, so that the board would have and uh, be able to review the CEO and also have as part of that responses from the staff. Right. Um, this can be very harmful or hurtful, if especially if the board, the CEO is the one who reads them directly. That wouldn't. That's not the best, but it can be very helpful because it helps bring to surface some things. The CEO is just we all have blind spots, and so it's not that the CEO is trying usually isn't trying to make life awful for people. They just don't realize what they're doing. Yeah. I just went through a, with that exact process with the board that I'm on Did doing you? the review of the ED. And it's, I think as volunteers from a board member's perspective, it can sometimes be challenging because I think it takes us close to a month and a half sometimes to go through the full review process of getting yeah. evaluations from staff, compiling them and making sure that they're anonymous, providing that feedback to the ED, getting their self-evaluation, then reporting back to the board, making, you know, compensation decisions, all of those things, right? right. <laughs> There's a lot of steps involved. But I have to say, making sure that, you know, we do get reviews and feedback from staff internally is so important because they work with that person every day, whereas we as volunteers have much different types of interaction with the executive director. And I've always found that for us to get really the best feedback we can, always ensuring and reassuring people that their responses are confidential, that no one's going yes. to see that their name is tied to them. Any sort of identifying details about what department they might be in, if it's really significant, will be removed. Yeah. I think that that really gives people more peace of mind to be able to share that. And also knowing that the board is sort of the filter or the buffer between them and the ED in right. this process is, is really helpful. Well, and it's also helpful if you know that there are going to be some bad apples. And some organizations that will be toxic or, or um, trying to get their barbs in there. Um, and so that's another reason for the board to be the filter. But um, it takes a commitment. 
it really takes a commitment to this is something that we value and we're going to do. And uh, there's one organization I know of in Indiana, yeah, in Indiana, Anna, based out of there, they uh, work around the world, who their development director. So it doesn't just take the board or the senior leader, it can be your divisional leader. Uh, each of us are leaders and we can express that and expand that leadership. Um, and so this particular developer director said, I want each of you and my staff, everybody on the staff, at least one hour every week doing professional development on company time, on oh, or organizational God. time, taking a webinar, going, you know, reading uh, Chronicle, looking at a Regari paper, anything, just uh, join, do something professional development because that's a commitment and he holds them to it. He evaluates whether they've done it or not. So. That's really amazing. And I think that kind of feeds in well to the last question I wanted to ask you before we go to some of did our questions. Did you like how I did questions. that? I know, it was great. <laughs> so um, <laughs> one of the things I always tell people is that really, ultimately, they're the CEO of their own personal and professional yes. development. No one is going to care about it as much as they're going to. And so even though it's great to work with your employer to figure out you know, professional development plans, it's so important to think about how you want to develop yourself as a leader whatever that definition of leader looks like for you, whether it's in a, an official leadership role or even just where you are currently in your job. And so I wanted to ask you if you had any thoughts or advice for people on how they can sort of create a plan for themselves or work towards developing their own leadership skills. Boy, do I ever. <laughs> <laughs> so I have four immediate responses that come to this. One of the first is you got to know what you want. Uh, frankly, I'm a Franklin Covey certified coach, so you know the, you'll hear a lot of the seven habits woven in through my answers if you're familiar with them. But beginning with the end in mind is crucial. Um, just like many people that go into management and leadership don't understand what it takes to manage or lead, hmm. many of us that are going to employment or 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 you know self-employment don't understand what it takes to do what we do. Um, a lot of employees just kind of think that there is an employee mentality of you owe me, I'm doing your service and you need to make it right. And you've got to pay me more because I don't have to do more. I just have to get paid more because my bills are big. And that's not going to be, that's a non-starter. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was early in my career, I sat down with the Dean who is uh, my boss and said to her, uh, you know, Pam was her name. I said, what is it that, what responsibilities do I need to take on now so that in six months you can be fully justified giving me a raise and uh, a promotion? What and I wanted the raise and the promotion because we all know that we can get promoted without any raise or pay yeah. increase. I wanted it both. She was shocked. She never had any, but never had anybody ask her. I, I knew because I'd said leadership, the only way that an organization is going to pay me more is if I'm be of more value for them. Mm. Clear. I mean, it was like, duh. So I went to her with that duh of, all right, I clearly need to be doing more. And I'm trying to see, evaluate what's the more that I need to be doing. Um, mm. And at that point, she said she didn't see anything. She loved it. She was so grateful. She didn't see any way for me to be promoted within the organization because in that department because everybody seemed set, hmm. which was helpful. And I made my lateral move into fundraising. And within six months, everybody from the dean down was out of the office. And there was a whole completely different admissions office at that point. Wow. <laughs> um, but I was in fundraising, and that had been a very good thing for me. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, if we talk about uh, Megan Gutterove, uh both with Mazarin Trays and with myself at the Nonprofit Academy and Mazarin's Leadership uh, um, Conference has talked about employee ne salary negotiation. Mm -hmm. And it's really important uh, in that to know it's not just money. What do you want for yourself? What are your values? Uh, if you Google value sheet, and I'm sorry, because I know some people are told on another thing, Google it. But if you Google values and Timothy Leonard, and I'll try to make it available to you after so that I, I can find one. But just kind of highlighting what are the things that you value? Uh, is it freedom or is it security? Is it independence or is it a team spirit? Mm -hmm. um, so beginning with the end in mind, flexibility is huge. And there's a lot of employers that may be more open to that. They can't pay more, but they may be able to shift hours, do a four hour work, you know, 40 hours in four days or something. Mm -hmm. So um, I think you're right. No one's going to do it for you. You got to do it yourself. You got to take it responsibility for your own, life and uh, figure out what it is, first of all, you're shooting for. Because if you don't know that book, there's another famous 70s book. It's funny, I was born in the 70s, but I'm quoting all these books from it. Um, if you don't know where you're going, you'll probably end up somewhere else. Mm. And I think a lot of people that are facing retirement now are experiencing that. They got into a job and they started doing things well, but they never realized, what is my end goal? 
Mm-hmm. And so now there's this pressure in nonprofits with 10,000 baby boomers reaching retirement age every day in, in America and in the United States um, that there's this pressure because there's going to be a mass exodus and there's going to be a lot of, uh, there's already a lot of Gen Xers in leadership, but there's still a lot of boomers that don't feel they can retire, but they're going to have to, um, and, or they're going to die because that's what happens too. Shocker. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of people coming up into, into leadership and it's better now that we all decide what is it that we want to be as leaders. Um, so there's, there's the beginning with the end of mind. I find writing a personal mission statement to be perfect for me. Mm-hmm. It took a long time. It took years to do. But uh, basically, I wrote out every role I had in my life, um, husband, father, student. Uh, for me, my faith is important, so I put disciple, uh, employee or worker. And I wrote, what are the things I want people to be saying about me when I pass on? Like mm-hmm. if I'm uh, listening to my own funeral. Um, and then I put some, and, and it was interesting. I just reviewed this uh, again, and I try to review it regularly. Um, and it's very motivating to me. So that's, that can be one the first thing. Can okay. I give three more before we get yeah, to questions? Absolutely. Okay, cool. So then what I like to do with, with leaders that are already in leadership is that, uh, there's a three-part process that we work through. Of, um, and I use the Highlands Ability Boundary, but you can use DISC. You can use Myers-Briggs. You can use StrengthsFinder. There's all sorts of... I'm an assessment junkie. I love assessments. I want to just take the next assessment, unless it's BuzzFeed, because I don't know what they're doing with my information. But other ones I'm really excited about because I want I figured the best me I can be, if I know who I am and how I'm made, mm-hmm. I can free myself up to, from trying to do other things and let other people do what they're great at too. Yeah, that's um, it's and it's freeing to realize, oh my goodness, we're limited. Oh, all right. Um, so I've, I love DISC, uh, you know, the personality, the ancient Greek personality theories, um, which is really simple. Um, Myers-Briggs is much more complex, but it's also can be, you know, just help you knowing where you get your energy, where you don't get your energy and why you interact with people in different ways. What all I love right. about the highlight. Okay. So go ahead. <laughs> um, what do you think? It's probably an E something. <laughs> shocking isn't it i know i know, I know. I, yeah it, i'm sorry if you yeah. didn't guys didn't realize i was an extrovert um enfj so visionary oh, i'm an infj and my wife was too and it was interesting in our first years of marriage we'd get to the same point of exhaustion and same like we'd be on the same page about everything and we'd go to our little tiny postage stamp office and then i'd say oh could we just go to a movie or just go to starbucks because i didn't realize it at the time but i needed to just kind of recharge my batteries right. and she'd be like why you that's our biggest fights were oh i want to just watch tv and knit because she needed to zone out um and be recharged that way so right. yeah infj enfj that's yeah. cool um i was a p at the beginning uh mm-hmm. but my board on the border and i needed to learn because of some of my other tendencies i needed to learn a lot of j which is deci- decisiveness and i had to learn deadlines and, and stuff right. so now i'm the guy at the meeting that's like okay dream big but get to the point I'm Who's going to do what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so my, the, the Highlands Abilities Boundary is one that's also out there where instead of how do you feel about things, it's mind-numbing tasks under time limits. Okay. You have to do, I think, 19 work samples under a short amount of time, and you just see what comes naturally to you. And it, it, it surfaces out what are stri- some stress that we didn't even know we had in our life. So part of it for me, too, is with um, a high in this one ability that um, indicates I need to get moving around. And so if I were in that managerial position where I was button seat at a desk, I would probably feel incredibly stressed as opposed to a job that had me traveling around a lot. So that's helped guide my, yeah. my career choices. So anyway, just getting to know yourself. That's the first part. Mm-hmm. The second part is story. Um, I, and your, your folks are going to love this too. Um, I love, there's a guy named John Eldridge who wrote a book called Epic and it's about, uh, he's written a lot of books on story, but one of the techniques, one of the things I got from him was thinking about all the, and you've heard me say this before at conferences, but what are the, and for all of you that are listening, think about your favorite characters in films or books, Hmm. take a moment and think, and then as you do that, figure out what are the things about them that, that you like. So for me, and this is the process that went through for me, when I was reading this book, I was thinking, how goofy. Of course, in Lord of the Rings, it's Gandalf. Everybody loves Gandalf. I want to be Gandalf. That's what I want to be. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I looked over to here because, oh, sorry, that was kind of freaky for people. But I have a little Gandalf figure because of this process. It reminds me of our wizard. It's not technically mm-hmm. Gandalf. It's not licensed. But 
it's German, so it's something special. Wizard-like. Uh, <laughs> wizard-like, yeah. But it was interesting because I didn't realize that some people didn't want to be Gandalf. They wanted to be Aragorn or they wanted to be Frodo. There are other things. But for me, it was so clear for why I wanted to be Gandalf because he was a scholar and a, and a warrior. Hmm. He ha- took action, but he really studied, especially in the books. He went and dug out through all the archives and he, he did the scholarly stuff and he kept it in mind and was able to assimilate over lifetimes. Um, and I'm a total nerd and I love that. And I'm don't shy away from a fight. Like I don't, you know, interpersonal stuff. I'm like, let's, let's hammer it up right now. You know, you have an issue with me. I have an issue with you. Let's talk this through because life's too short and you're too important to not talk about this. Let's get this done. Um, but other people have other ways. And so one of my clients said, Leah, and it, um, I said, well, talk to me about princess Leah. What was her, what's, and it turns out she felt like she was at war, this mm-hmm. client. There, so it sh- can shed light. The character you must resonate with can shed light on it. That's um, really interesting. Another, yeah, another character, another guy that I had, uh, had Kevin Costner's character in Dances with Wolves okay. and um, Sean Connery's char- character in Hunt for Red October. Mm. Both military officers right. who were both in really entrenched systems that needed to change to fit with the times and to do what was socially just. Oh, interesting. Very interesting with his perspective, working with a unionized labor force and trying to help them see some of the changes in the industry they were in that needed to be done. Yeah. Uh, so we could keep coming back to that. So it, there's... Yeah. Yeah. I, know, I, I like this technique. I mean, it's. I, I think sometimes... People really struggle with, at least in my kind of circles that I run in, being able to have the space to be reflective. And I think especially for extroverts, sometimes like sitting down and journaling is like not what someone wants to do, right? <laughs> so having these other tools and techniques that you've mentioned about like- I have to down. force myself to do it. I mean, I carry my moleskin everywhere. Yeah. But it's a learned habit. So that's the thing. If you have natural tendencies, mm-hmm. you can learn skills to compensate for yeah, those. That's and right. that's, um, so the last thing is, so doing the character thing. And then the last one is goal setting. Um, and learning good goal setting. There's a lot of tools out there. Um, one of the, one that uh, is free is Magnet Goals that I do, uh, where I've assimilated a bunch of the different the things I like from a bunch of different programs. And it's just it's it's an intuitive goal setting process. But I'm I'm afraid that we may be running out of time, and I want to make sure to get the answers. But as long as we know what our end goal is, kind of know what we're really good at, so that we'll be able to say, no, you know, um, I don't think I'm good at this. I'm willing to give it a try. So. Um, when we go into a new setting, sometimes we'll say that our our board board membership is a key thing. Um, I know the term is three years. My wife and I will say we have found that we're only good for about twelve months. Mm-hmm. It's a strong twelve months, and we usually ask amazing questions and help new systems get started. But then we're done. And if you're not okay with that, we're totally understand that, and we're good. Um, but this is our this is sort of our t- this is our this is what we're good at. We're good at pivots and changes. Um, and not creating havoc. We don't want to clean up, you know, leave a mess and have somebody else clean up. That's not our style. But then, so knowing what you're good at and then also uh, knowing kind of what character you respond to can be really insightful. And then also being clear on your goals so that you're working to them, whether you're getting them in your work or outside your work, um, you're being able to build up who you are, that value so that the next position or the next opportunity, you're ready for it. Hmm. That's such great advice. Thank you so much for sharing, Mark. Yeah. Um, I wondered if you have can stick around for maybe like another 10 minutes or so. Let's do it. Some questions. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. So we'll go ahead and answer Kelly's first. So Kelly asked, what is the best way to take initiative slash be a leader when you have multiple chains of command to go through to complete a task? Oh, Kelly, I'm so <laughs> sorry. Oh, and I love that for those of you that are not on Crowdcast, there, there are upvotes and that's been upvoted even so since many. we started. That's really funny. <laughs> um, so this is an interesting, uh, and it's a, it's an it's a really hard challenge. I had a client that was uh, in a structure where she was the uh, executive director of one or one aspect, and then also, or she was a player in one aspect and a player in another. She had, you know, that dotted line of communication, which means both of the people think they're about your boss. Um, I have found that it helps a lot to know what your job is. And, and although it's not what I, I don't like getting all legalistic and saying, these are the roles that are expected of me. Um, I, I remember slightly different situation, but with one boss, I sat down, she had given me a whole bunch of things she wanted for the new fiscal year. Okay. Good stuff. Each one of them, A1 priority, totally. I understood it individually. But then I, I was feeling overwhelmed. So I wondered, why am I feeling overwhelmed? So I took a legal pad and wrote out all the things I already do it on one side and then put the new things on the other. 
And I just sat down with her and I said, different boss, not the same boss, but I went to this boss and said, I need your help. And she said, okay, why? And she wanted to help. I said, because these are all the things that I'm currently doing. These are all the things that you want me to do this new year. And in isolation, each one of them looks amazing. I totally understand why this is a value and a, and a need. I need your help to know when I'm on the fence and I have to either finish the grant application because the deadline's due or pick up the phone because it's important for people to hear a live human and not go to voicemail. Where do I shift my weight? Um, and so part of it could be doing that in, um, with your bosses. Now, some of you don't have emotionally healthy bosses that you'd be able to have this with. Um, but if you're able to have that conversation, I didn't know how she'd respond. Uh, she, she took the, the, the legal pad and leaned back in her chair. And I thought, oh, no, I've blown it. Um, and it turns out I, I let it sit for a while. But as an extrovert, that's hard. Silence is hard or was hard. Um, and I asked her, what's up? And she said, I wish I could do this with my boss. So part of it is when you're managing up, when you're training, when you're taking ownership of your own job responsibilities and having boundaries that you're trying to at least establish, if not enforce, just figure out where is the boundary. Um, that's training. The, you're helping the organization become healthier. Mm -hmm. So that could be part of it. Um, the other part of it I have found to be incredibly helpful, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, Vanessa, too, is um, getting a peer network outside of your organization. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I have, I've been in more situations where it was really important for me to be the local chapter on the local chapter board or the regional board or the national board, because those for me were the peer networks of people that were able to call. I was able to call and say, this just happened. Am I nuts? I ticked off and have them say, yeah, you need to step it down, Mark. That was totally legitimate of your boss mm -hmm. or to say, nope. You're right on. That was, they did you wrong there. So um, being able to know your own boundaries and try to figure those out and, um, and being able to express to a person um, that and have those frank conversations and they don't have to be attacks. Hmm. The, can you help me out? Kind of predisposes someone to want to be helpful instead of feeling like you're, you're going in for the fight. Hmm. Um, but then also being able to have peers that it can share with each other. It helps to have them not in your organization because you're talking about your organization and, and it's not about gossip. It's about real help. I have this person who's doing this to me right now. Uh, what are you guys, how are you handling this? Uh, I was talking to a young nonprofit professionals group in Atlanta and I said, can I just ask you guys, I am so fed up with all the people that slam millennials from the stage. It just seems like it's a cheap laugh. Is it frustrating you as much as it's frustrating me? I'm a Gen Xer, but I was the butt of that 10, 15 years ago. Right. And I totally, people were like, wow, yeah, oh, it's <laughs> awful. But they had each other to talk to, they said, so that they were able to then figure out strategies around that stuff. Mm. But Vanessa, what have you seen for people that have multiple managers with dotted lines and straight lines? And yeah, it's always confusing when that happens. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I mean, I'm always such a process and systems person. Even when I was like much lower in an org chart, I always like to have like clear processes for things that needed to get done. And one of the ways that I took initiative to also just get clarity on what was happening was to actually create process documents to understand who was actually involved in what so that there was Absolutely. a really clear chain of command because I think sometimes when you do have multiple managers or an executive director and you know COOs and a chief development officer, all of these different people, it can get unclear as to who's really responsible or what their roles are. That's really true. Processes. Yeah. Yeah, so I think having process documents as an organization, which is probably one of the least exciting projects for people to take on, is so important. <laughs> it will really just give you a lot of clarity, and it helps you figure out where you can take initiative and what your roles are in some of those processes, so it's clear for you as well. Um, I think uh, so how would you do that? I mean, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of like a pad of paper and sure. um, this task – and this is the oversight person. So if this person mm -hmm. says something to me, I'll say, thank you. I'll be sure to bring it, talk to them about that when we next yeah. meet. But what do you, yeah. so I mean, for me, like when I've done that in my roles, I've typically made out a list of like, what are the big recurring things I work on each week or each month, for instance. So there might be processes like, you know, getting acknowledgement letters or um, 
tax receipts out in the mail, for instance. Hmm. So let's say I was in charge of that, or that was like one of the things that was on my to-do list every week. Um, but sure. there's other people who are involved in that. So one organization I worked with, we had a big data department who was responsible for processing all of the gifts and then printing out the receipts. And then the receipts would make their way to my desk eventually. So I knew that like I would get the receipts on certain days, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then once I got them, it was up to me to figure out who I needed to write a note to and who the executive director needed to write a note to. And then I would give the letters to uh, them and then they would come back to me and go off to mailing. But, but for a long time, they would just go to the executive director and then it would take forever for me to get them. And I was like, well, like, am I ever going to get this done? <laughs> this big backlog yeah. of like tax receipts forever. And having wow. clarity over like a better way to process that and a better role for me to have in that gave me more clarity and the ability to take initiative and to just be able to kind of speed things up internally. Um, so I always think the best thing you can do is just make a list of those things that you work on regularly. And then sometimes when you're trying to figure out what the current process is, literally just write down step by step as you go through it. Yeah, like every day absolutely. you're working on something like I did this and then to move this forward, I did this or whatever. Yep, and, then, and I did that in Evernote, yeah. like especially um, computer tasks, I'll take screenshots yeah. and put it in Evernote just because I can't always remember. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> it, you know, doing my, my <laughs> monthly financials, I change the category on when I'm writing it in by accident. Right. Um, but, the, but it also helps because then you're allowing yourself to be worked out of a job. Hmm. I mean, we should always be looking for someone else that can be taking over part of our job. Um, and so that could be a good thing too. Yeah, and I mean, I think once I get a process down on paper or some sort of system down on paper, the question I always like to ask is where are the bottlenecks in it? Like where, where are we being wow. slowed down? That's a good where question. Where is this like not working well? Where are there too many cooks in the kitchen? Where can we simplify it? Figuring out like those kinds of questions and then being able to wow. revamp it or sort of rethink it, I think just brings better clarity and more efficiency into it for sure. Wow, that's excellent. Yeah, so that's <laughs> I, I should be interviewing you. This is great. <laughs> I, Process I, I, is one of those things for me. It's like, <laughs> yes, I know we need to do it. I know it's good you know, for us. It's like taking vitamins. Okay. I, yeah, I was never a fan of process until probably like three or four years ago. And then I discovered it and I was like, this just makes everything easier. <laughs> it and people know what's expected of them. And I think that gets to the, yeah. the next question here is um, from, I, I think it's, nope. Oh, okay. That one's too, okay. Um, Do you want to answer Winston's next? Is that the is yeah? Let's. I think that's the one we've got next. So the question is: um, In almost all nonprofits I've worked in, I've noticed that many middle manage uh, that many middle managers and even some leadership have very little explicit training as managers and team leaders. Um, how do we combat this trend in the industry and ensure that those leadership positions um, are actually leaders and skilled managers, not simply folks who have been with the organization a long time? So <laughs> we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, we did. And part yeah. of what you just said is knowing the process, um, mm -hmm. having them know what the process is, because most, I don't, I dare say most nonprofit leaders or leaders in organizations don't have an understanding. Like uh, an executive director, unless they're a database administrator, doesn't know what it takes to input a gift or mm -hmm. to update, you know, mailing addresses from a mailing. So yeah. um, being able to have it processed out can help them give some clarity. Uh, I was working with one uh, one ass 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 administrative assistant who's a client and had her start taking time tasks. You know, what is it? How long? You know, just call 100 people to say thank you. All right. That's what your your boss wants you to do. How long does that take? Mm -hmm. How long does each call? Finding the number, dialing the number, opening up their data donor database so you can see who they are, see if they've communicated lately, leaving a message or talking to them and then taking notes that you've made the contact. Um, I find it takes six to 10 minutes per call minimum. Mm -hmm. And so I know that that'll take X number of hours and being able to share that with people, it may frustrate your boss. But um, one of the things that in the Concord and the, the Concord leadership groups uh, leadership report is um, starting just some sort of job, of, you know, leadership development can feel so grandiose and there can be so many expectations about it and so people may fish you know farm it out to like the fish uh, fish or fish sticks kind of formula or the one minute manager or whatever the the latest in, in the box is and they're all they all have benefits to them 
but they tend to come across as let's buy the t-shirt and let's do the balloon drop and our organizational culture is totally changed because we went through this training. Um, and I'm not a fan of that. I'm more of a fan of let's make real change. Um, and those, those can make real change. I'm not, I'm not mocking that. Um, but one of the things is to find out, uh, just asking your peers, if you're not in the senior level of leadership, asking your peers, what are the things that you feel like you need help with? What are the skills that you wish we could learn and would help us do this organizational work better? Or if you have direct reports, asking them. We did this in a hospital I worked at and we were shocked, shocked to find that people thought one of the most pressing things that they needed was Excel spreadsheet training. Really? That's a commodity. That's a total commodity. There are, you know, career track things and all these other, yeah, you could get that anywhere. So we had a trainer come in and here's the, what we put in the report, just here's a, just the way to make it so you get kind of double your money. If you bring somebody in to do a training, then the next month, make sure everybody is required to report back on what they did. So what we would do in our leadership institute is we'd have the training and we also looked at our strategic plan which, you know, not surprisingly, most nonprofits don't have a strategic plan, even the biggest nonprofits. But uh, we'd look at our strategic plan and say, if our organization is going to get to where we needed to go, mm -hmm. what kind of skills and talents and strengths do we need to have developing now? Yeah, that's true. Um, so that's two ways to look at it. What are, what are we feel are our felt needs and, and shortcomings? And what is our organizational mission calling us to be good at? Mm. Um, but we have the training. And it could, sometimes it was just us getting up and training because we had an interest or an area of expertise in that. And then the next month, it was a round table of all the, everybody going around saying, so this is what I picked up, took away from this thing. This is what I tried to do in the last four weeks. And this is what I failed at. And this is what I did well at. And when everybody knew they were going to be on the hook, um, it started just rippling out. It started transforming a culture. A lot of this culture, culture change that we're talking about is, is a process. Um, and, and that's, kind of frustrating but the good news is when we take the responsibility to make a change ourselves it does have it expands it's a ripple effect um stephen mr covey stephen covey's son wrote a book called uh, change at the speed of trust that measuring trades introduced me to okay. and one of the things he said is the most one of the most important trust things that we can do is start keeping commitment to ourselves when we start becoming trustworthy with ourselves, saying we're going to get up at a certain time, we're going to work out at a certain time, or we're going to spend 30 minutes of our job reading industry blogs that will help us be better at who we are or reading uh, a book. Um, that was one of my commitments. I knew I'd be better yeah. at my job if I improved. And I read 50 to 75 books a year anyway, but I wanted to read at my desk. And it, was, it felt like a gutsy move. It felt like a really, you know, I'm a slacker for doing this. But it was, it was interesting how I sat taller and I spoke with more authority in the areas that I had influence over hmm. uh, because I knew what was going on or I knew what the latest theory was or I knew what some of the open rates were or whatever the, the issue was. Right. So hopefully yeah. those things help. What would you say to Winston? Oh, um, I mean, I think, you know, Judy commented below that in her organization, um, they cannot or will not pay well. And so sometimes people are rewarded for staying by being given higher positions. And so I was thinking just this kind of like um, to stop conflating rather like longevity of being at an organization with like ability and skill. Uh, just because someone's been there a long time doesn't necessarily mean they're like the best person to be in that job or well that's that yeah, whole thing just, have you yeah. <laughs> you have 15 years of experience or do you have one year of experience repeated 15 times <laughs> yeah well i think that's a really great point and so i think just being able to stop conflating those two and sort of separating them out is really important um and being able to you know objectively look at candidates and say you know you know, is it really just because they've been here a long time that we want to promote them? Or is it, they, mm. that, is it the case that they're actually the best person for this position? Um, so I think that's probably like one of the first things I would look at. Um, I should just say there's one training center that I've been through before that I thought was really good. Um, it's called the Management Center. And it's a little bit mm. more geared to progressive nonprofits, providing them with management training. Um, and they have a program and also a book um, and I'm pretty sure the book is on Amazon. It's called Managing to Change the World. And it's all nice. about managing in the nonprofit sector. But I've read it. I thought it was a really fantastic read um, just as sort of an introduction to managerial skills because it's yeah. really true. No one is born with good managing skills. <laughs> like it's really yeah. something you have to learn. Um, and for me, that's been a really useful resource over the years. 
And if you don't have any of those resources, I would say Kunz and Posner's The Leadership Challenge, it's in its fifth edition. It was part of my master's program. It was, it's amazing and researched. Um, the, you know, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People, I avoided for years because I thought it was how to manipulate people and make them do what you want them to. But it's not. It's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it just talks about remembering people's names and the importance of not, you know, um, looking for what is in it for them, not just what's in it for you. Um, learning some of these soft skills and people skills. And that's where the Myers-Briggs and DISC and all those can be very helpful because you start realizing that, wait, just because I see the world this way, not everybody has my glasses. Um, somebody else sees the world through a totally different lens. Um, and even if I think it's totally ludicrous and crazy, I might have to work with that person. And so how do I speak their dialect? How do I learn to, to put things in ways that they understand and anticipate their need? I know that this is, you know, they're not going to get the receipts off their desk. Maybe I need to go get them myself. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, though. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like it's really easy, Winston. Um, I'm sorry about. Sorry if it sounds glib. It's not. But some of the changes can be simple. They're just, but they're hard to yeah, put into true. practice. Yeah. So I want to answer Ivy's question next because um, I think it's a really interesting one um, that kind of gets to some of the generational issues. And I think Emily asked a similar question as well. Um, so Ivy's question is, I'm, a, um, I'm in a senior position at my organization, but I'm more than 10 years younger than all of the other senior leaders. My organization is very supportive, but sometimes I feel like the kid in the group. Any advice for younger managers? And I actually have an answer to this. If it's okay. For oh, me. please. Because <laughs> that was the one that scared me because I just have so little patience for people that are older and think they're better or they know more because the younger person or assume that they don't, the younger people don't have a life. I mean, that's, there's so many assumptions that are, so, so I have a lot of tolerance for those people. Yeah. So I have a lot of compassion for this question, Ivy, especially because- I do too. Like, that's my compassion. I don't have tolerance for the people that are <laughs> that are forcing it on Ivy. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, it's not to me like it's more of an issue on your part, like your mindset about being a younger person mm -hmm. in the group, um, which I totally understand because for years I had like a real chip on my shoulder about being really young and that I was too young to be taken seriously. And I had this story that I carried with me probably until like a year or two ago, really, um, that nobody, you know, people knew how old I was or if they knew my experience um, or whatever, they wouldn't take me as seriously because I wasn't as older as some of my other colleagues. And I realized recently that that wasn't the case at all. It was really just this mindset that I had about it. And it really was up to me to shift my own perspective that, you know, I might wow. be a young person in consulting or in a leadership role, but that was okay. I can own that and feel confident about it and feel good about it. And feeling insecure about it and feeling like I was constantly under the scrutiny of others, which didn't really exist, wasn't going to help me ultimately. <laughs> in fact, it was just going to keep me really small in my thinking and understanding about myself as a leader. So that was what I wanted to add to that, because I think that's such an important piece, especially for so people who are young people in leadership roles, especially if it's, if you're not experiencing, you know, I would say like bullying or like blatant ageism in your workplace. So right. it's more about your own mindset. I think there's something you can absolutely shift about that and just kind of letting go of that story that just because you're young, you won't be taken seriously or that you're, you know, the kid in the group, you know, it doesn't serve you. <laughs> Let it go and, you know, embrace a new story about how being a young person in leadership is a really great thing for you and something to really be proud of. That's why I have a beard because I knew when I got into <laughs> fundraising, I didn't want people thinking I was their grandson. And that wouldn't happen today. <laughs> but back when I started 20 years ago, uh, and I already had gray hair since seventh grade, it was gray in my hair anyway. So I wanted that ambiguity, but I had a very similar story to you. Now, for those of you that have um, blatant ageism going on, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that is amazing, I have found to be amazing in proving my worth, and it's, I, I resonate with this question because I still put Gen Xer in my bio, mm -hmm. like in my short bio on Twitter or something, I put I'm a Gen Xer because, uh, and I, I think it's, an, it's just, it was a chip on my shoulder that it was sort of like, yeah, I'm different and um, I'm going to get it, you know, I don't know, there's a whole mindset I could go in. I love generational studies and I could go into that too. But um, for the people that are experiencing ageism, part of it is if you're doing, if you can figure out metrics that the organization values and that are in line with your integrity, you know, that are, don't violate your integrity, as long as you're hitting those on a consistent basis, those have a tendency to change people's mindset. Uh, and it may not be because, you know, they may still say stuff about age, which is it's so wrong on so many levels, but 
if you start bringing in whatever it is, if it's improving employee morale and you have a statistical increase in that, or if it's um, hitting certain marketing uh, goals or fundraising goals, that's why I love fundraising is because even if, whether my age didn't matter, admissions work at a college too, it, my age mattered, but it was, was, was I hitting the numerical goals? And that could get you in the backside too. That could be bad, but it could be really good because you could just look at, you know, the proof in the pudding. I'm doing. I'm doing. I'm excelling at this, um, and I think, in light of what Vanessa said, part of that also gets back to you. Of, hmm, I'm hitting my goals. I'm doing the right thing. I feel like I'm making this up as I go, and most of us as leaders feel like you know we're imposters. And if you know we're the the man in the Wizard of Oz, don't look behind the curtain. Um, but as you start figuring out, and you can set those objectives yourself if your job doesn't have them. Is there a certain number of calls you want to make every week? Uh, is there a certain number of people that you want to talk to? Are there certain influencers in the media you need to be communicating with and developing relationships with? You can have these sort of goals yourself that are internal, and you'll start noticing that you start presenting yourself as an authority anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and there's always, and I'm sorry to say this, because I'm sure your organization needs you more than they even know, but there are organizations that don't treat you like that. Um, so there's, there's always voting with your feet too. That's a good point. Yeah. I really appreciate your advice on that, Mark. Um, I want to, too. I love that story. Like, That's really, thanks for sharing that. Wow. Um, I thought we would wow. answer one last question and I think this will be a good one to end on, um, from Abby. She asked if we had any leadership or management podcast recommendations, and maybe I broaden that to say book recommendations since I know you and I are both bookworms. <laughs> <laughs> good. Well, May I, may I share my podcast? Yes, okay. Um, the first, one of them is the Concord Leaders podcast where I uh, go to concordleadershipgroup.com slash podcasts. Um, with it, ask or without, it doesn't matter. It will get you there. Um, I interview executive directors and it's only, they're only usually 10 to 15 minutes, but I ask them, what do they love about leadership? What's time that it didn't work and how did they fix it? And what do you think a leader should do right now? And I, and so if you're, any of you are listening and you're executive director or CEO of your organization, um, you want to be on the podcast, feel free to just reach out to me. Um, can I give my email? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mark, M-A-R-C at Concord Leadership Group com. But what I'm trying to do is create, it's, it's fascinating to me to hear what leaders that have been in it for a long time are struggling with versus what leaders that are new to it are in. And so there you can listen. There's a, about 14 episodes up right now. Um, how about you? What are you, what's a podcast you listen to? Oh, if you I, listen, a podcast? I listen to so many podcasts. Oh, <laughs> right do you? Okay. There's any like leadership specific ones. A lot of the ones I listen to are more business related than they are nonprofit specific. Um, but one that yeah. I really enjoy that I feel like I picked up some interesting management advice is called Profit Power Pursuit. It's hosted by a woman named Tara Gentili. Um, it's not necessarily a nonprofit podcast, but I feel like she's a really great interviewer and I've learned some really fascinating things over the years from that podcast. Um, the book I would recommend, yeah. um, and I blogged about this last week actually, is by, I'm trying to think, I don't have it on my desk, it's on my bookshelf. <laughs> it's by, I, know, I keep um, looking, where's my book? I, I want to get my book too. It's by um, Tara Moyer, it's called Playing Big and it's probably, I think, one of the mm. only books on women's leadership specifically. It's fantastic. And if you appreciated what I said about mindset um, and leadership, as, especially as a young person or a young woman, you'll really enjoy that book. She has some really interesting insight just around how women can develop themselves as leaders and do what she calls playing big in their lives and in their work. Nice. So another podcast that I've started, I've started listening to podcasts again. I forget to, I don't have a system for it. So they become like to do lists that are just growing and not ending. But one of them is entre, entre leadership. Oh, I've yeah. liked the book, uh, Dave Ramsey's book. And I like the podcast gets a little hypey, but um, there are a lot of my friends that are, in, <laughs> that are interviewed on it, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Like I know these people and to hear their stories, like Jeff Goins was at a recent one where he talked about our true artists don't start. We have this mindset that if you're an artist, you have to be a starving artist. And he's uh, done some research to find that there, all through history, there have been artists that didn't starve. And mm -hmm. it's a mindset issue. And it's a story you're telling yourself. If you're a starving artist, it's a choice that you're a starving artist is his premise. But having those things to tweak you are good. And it also helps you communicate with non nonprofit people. So board members and others, they're not thinking like nonprofits. And so sometimes it can be helpful to learn the dialect or learn the thought process. Um, the books that come to mind are, I'm a diehard Seven Habits fan, uh, Seven <laughs> Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, it, 
it changed my life when I read it as a teenager and it's still uh, paying dividends. Uh, most people find it to be a little bit academic. So his, uh, his another son wrote uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens, which mm -hmm. is uh, same book, same content, and it's a lot more accessible for, for adults and others too. Um, so that, and then there also there's a book called First Things First that he wrote with another couple, um, and it's all about time management. And I think that's one of the things that all of us could grow in leadership of is our time. Because mm -hmm. it's so easy to put out fires and respond to other people's urgencies, and we don't know how to not do that. But as we start focusing on what's truly important and not urgent, that's when we grow as leaders and we're able to really uh, multiply our effectiveness. Nice. That's fantastic. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us here today on Summer So Fundraising. glad you had me. This thank you. This such an great. awesome conversation. I really enjoyed it. And I want to thank everyone for sticking around right to the end with us. I hope you've also enjoyed yeah, our I conversation know. here today. Um, Mark, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they have questions after today's broadcast? Uh, the Twitter, I'm on uh, the Twitter. Oh, the Twitter. great. I sound like my grandmother. <laughs> the Walmart, uh, the Twitter, um, I'm Mark A. Pittman, M-A-R-C-A-P, isn't Peter, I-T-M-A-N. Um, the leadership report, you can get at conqueredleadershipgroup.com slash report. And if you Google Magnet Goals, you can get the link to go to Magnet Goals for that too. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for being here. I really appreciate your expertise and perspective on this topic. Um, for everyone else who's listening in, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back here next week, not on Tuesday since it's 4th of July, but on Wednesday. Mazarin Trey is a Wild Women Fundraising will be joining me. We're going to talk about gender issues in fundraising, which I'm sure will be a lively conversation, <laughs> an interesting one, no, no doubt. And in the meantime, if you'd like to connect with me and also the wonderful community of folks over at the Storytelling Nonprofit, there's a link just below this video. It's a big green button that says Join the Storytelling Nonprofit Lounge on Facebook. So you can follow that link over there and join the conversation in our community group. Thanks so much, everyone, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Take care. Bye. Bye.